Museum of Disability History and to the opening of our newest exhibit, War and Disability. My name is Tess Frazier, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm the director here at the museum. I would like to take a moment to thank Deaf Adult Services, who's providing our interpretation services this evening. I would also like to thank the members of our museum board, People Inc. board, and People Inc. Foundation board who are joining us tonight. For those of you who are visiting our museum for the first time, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background of what we are and how we came to be. Our museum was founded in 1998 by the president and CEO of People Inc., Dr. James Bowles. Dr. Bowles was teaching a course at the University at Buffalo and wanted his students to have access to a variety of resources relating to disability history. He was surprised to learn that there was no such museum um, and the idea of the museum was born. We started as a small idea and grew into a collection of exhibits that was housed for many years in a small house in Williamsville. This upcoming October will mark our one year anniversary since reopening here at our new location. Being here has enabled us to redesign all of our existing exhibits, unveil a series of new exhibits, and expand our research library, which houses a growing collection of rare books and specialized documents. We are very proud to say that we are the only brick and mortar museum of its kind dedicated to the preservation of disability history. The museum recently teamed up with the University at Buffalo to establish the Center for Disability Studies. The purpose of the center is to encourage the study, teaching, and accurate representation of disability history and of individuals with disabilities. We at the museum believe that there's a need for people to learn and understand from a historical perspective how individuals with disabilities were once viewed and treated. Through our archives and our exhibits, we explore a variety of topics related to disability history. Our many educational outreach programs provide opportunities to educate all ages about disability history, etiquette, and the need to celebrate and accept our differences. Some of our educational programs include the Kids on the Block of Western New York Puppet Troupe, Disability History Curriculum for grades K through 12, and traveling exhibits which highlight thought-provoking topics in disability history. We're here tonight to unveil, unveil our newest exhibit, War and Disability. This exhibit took the better part of three years to research and compile, and we are so very proud to share this finished product with you this evening. <coughs> the exhibit would not have been possible without the incredible efforts of our museum staff, especially Reed Dunlavey and Doug Platt, and the guidance and expertise of Dr. Michael Rembus, and museum board members Dr. David Gerber and Eric Bauer. We also have some special guests joining us this evening. I'd like to acknowledge the Disabled American Veterans, number 120 honor roll from Tonawanda. <laughs> and also acknowledge Evangeline Conley from the VA and also welcome Judge Robert Russell. Judge Russell is an associate judge for Buffalo City Court and serves by appointment as an acting Erie County Court Judge. In January of 2008, Judge Russell created and began presiding over the nation's first Veterans Treatment Court. The National Vietnam Veterans of America awarded Judge Russell with the Vietnam Veterans of America 2010 Achievement Medal. Also, the National Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States awarded Judge Russell with the 2010 James E. Dan Zand Citizenship Award. It is my pleasure to introduce Judge Russell and to invite him up to the podium at this time to say a few words. Good evening. Good evening. It is truly a uh, pleasure and an honor to be here this evening at the opening of an awesome and wonderful exhibit, War and Disabilities. Uh, as I stand here, I, I'm humbled by the mere fact that uh, I am a grateful citizen who stands before you. I am grateful to the men and women who have served this country, 
have made the sacrifices to protect the freedoms that I enjoy and each and every one of us enjoy in this country. Uh, to our veterans and all who have served and all who may be presently serving, I thank you for your service. I was asked to bring a just a few remarks, and for those who know me, it's hard when you give me a podium. <laughs> it's like, what do you want me to do and condense it? <laughs> I'm grateful to People, Inc., to uh, Dr. James Bowe, and the vision that you had uh, and that you have for this museum. Uh, it's good to see my friend Kevin Hurrigan again and Bradford Watts and the staff of uh, People Inc. and the work that you do. I thank you for the grateful introduction that you gave to me. But I think it's important that each and every one of us become culturally competent and proficient with respects to disabilities, the history of disability, how it's had impacted not only our citizens, but in what way we can do to provide a quality of life, a life of dignity, a life of respect with regards to not only in how we interact, but with regards to employment, with regards to moving forward with our lives. I was definitely, uh, impressed by the War and Disabilities display in the museum. There was a, one particular panel, if you take a look at it, it's called The Fog of War. And in that particular panel, it, it definitely touches me and the work that I do in starting up a Veterans Treatment Corps because many of the men and women that I work with are those who are dealing with the challenges of the invisible wounds of war. Many are coming back with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's nice the panel on the fall award discussing the history and the different term and the terminology that was used during the course of military history with regards to what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. Some of major anxiety, major depression, and a number of our men and women are serving now multiple tours and the challenges that weigh not only on them but with respects to their family. Uh, to me, it's all that we can do to heighten awareness in our communities of our men and women and what they go through during the course of their service and what we can do as a grateful nation to not only say and display uh, the yellow ribbons and say welcome home, but to go further and say, what can we do to help to ensure that they have a legitimate, high quality of life? What we can do as far as for education, employment, and services. Uh, see a, a number of those that I work with in the Veterans Treatment Court. I'm grateful to the VA and uh, the representative from the VA hospital that's here, Vance. I'm grateful to the Veterans Homeless Coalition and the work that they do because it's important. I know you only told me a few more months, so I'm, I'm, getting to, I'm getting ready to get on the soapbox here. But you know what? But also, uh, uh, in, in addition to being thrilled about being here this, uh, this evening, and I, I want to say I also represent my wife. Of course, I always do, right? And my wife, uh, Bonnie Russell, she's the council person for the University District uh, in the city of Buffalo. She sends her regrets. Uh, she loves the work of People, Inc. So uh, unfortunately, circumstances preventing her from being here. So please accept her regrets. The other thing I wanted to mention is I'm so, it's good to see my buddy, Steve Manko. <laughs> and I wanted to be here to see him. Yeah, we all want to see him. He is. My hero and definitely our community's hero for the sacrifice of CBA. God bless you, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, guys.
the next person that I would like to introduce to you is one of our newest board members here at the museum, um, Eric Bauer. He's a veteran of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and is the president and CEO of his own successful business, EB Galaxy Construction. He fully believes in our mission and vision and has been a huge advocate and support um, up to our museum and he was a key player uh, in helping us bring this exhibit to life, finally. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Eric Bauer. great to be here tonight. Um, it's great to see the exhibit finally come to life and uh, be able to look through all the hard work that the museum has put together uh, to bring this to all of us. Um, as uh, she mentioned, I am a disabled veteran of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, through that experience uh, I've gained a great understanding and appreciation for the uh, sacrifices that our servicemen and women have uh, undertaken every day. They're <clears throat> uh, worldwide approximately 16% of disabilities are due to war and conflicts and uh, that's a surprising number and uh, for us to acknowledge that today is uh, extremely important to me. I've worked uh, since I've been out of the military uh, I've worked hard towards uh, bringing awareness for disabled veterans and their cause and also some of the transitional problems that they uh, may have uh, encountered going from military life to civilian life. So uh, to see everybody here supporting this cause is, uh, is, brings me uh, great joy. Uh, I'm excited about the exhibit because people, if you asked a veteran, what can I do for you? Um, I would have to say, from my perspective, to learn through history, to learn about the trials and uh, troubles that they may have gone through uh, is one of the biggest things you could do to support a veteran. Um, so uh, I hope everybody enjoys this exhibit and uh, I'm just very pleased to be a part of it. Thank you very much. While philosophers have long written about the might of the pen and the sword, Steve Banco has wielded both in service to country and community. After 16 months in combat in Vietnam, Steve returned home where he continued his legacy of service in the trenches and command posts of government at every level. He has served state assemblymen and state senators, a presidential candidate, and a mayor. He retired last fall as the field office director for the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. His memoirs and first-person accounts of Vietnam combat have been published across a broad spectrum of national publications, from the Wall Street Journal to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Steve is included in the Marlo Thomas compilation, Right Words at the Right Time, Volume 2. He was a contributor to the National Public Radio feature series, This I Believe. His writing has been recognized by Writer's Digest magazine, the Nelson Algren short fiction, competition at the Chicago Tribune, and by Freedom Foundation at Valley Forge. He is the author of Memories of War, Dreams and Peace, Echoes of the Vietnam War, published in 1998. But he is most proud of the 1994 Terry Anderson Award for his courage to come back from alcoholism and post-combat depression. Serving in the United States Army in Vietnam, Steve was wounded six times, including four gunshot wounds. He was decorated for combat heroism seven times, and his awards include the Silver Star, the nation's third highest combat decoration, four brown stars for valor, and four purple hearts. It is an honor and a pleasure to introduce Mr. Steve Banco. that introduction, I'm tired, I want to go home. <laughs> um, before I begin, let me, let me just start by uh, acknowledging the person, my, my hero. Um, we all have them, I'm sure, but uh, my wife, Shirley, 
uh, joining, joining me tonight, and she's my hero. Uh, why don't you sit down? <laughs> Throw those crutches away. <laughs> um, but uh, I've often said this, and I mean it uh, sincerely, that if you really want to hear the stories of heroism, don't just talk to the veterans who have experienced it. Talk to their wives and their, their lovers and their girlfriends and their families who have had to endure um, those invisible scars that uh, Judge Russell talked about. They're also uh, heroic. I'd, I'd like to begin with a, a little story tonight, and it involves your imagination. Imagine, if you will, that I'm about 60 pounds lighter and I have hair. <laughs> I once had a basketball scholarship to the University of Buffalo. Um, I didn't exactly capitalize on that opportunity, and that's how I got drafted. Uh, but the first time I got wounded, uh, I got shot in the calf. And I went to the doctor who was treating me, and I said, Doctor, is this going to ruin my basketball career? Because I did anticipate that I was going to come back home and pick up where I left off. And he said, no, no, the, the bullet is buried deep in your calf. We're not even going to take it out. It's, it's too deep. Um, you, it, you won't even know it's there. The second time I got shot, it was a little less gracious. Uh, I got shot in the, in the butt. And again, I asked the doctor the same thing. I said, doctor, am I going to be able to continue my basketball career? And he said, yeah, that this wound isn't going to affect your basketball playing at all. Just don't sit on the bench very much. <laughs> the third time I got shot, uh, it was a little more serious, and I knew that. I got shot twice in the knee. I broke my leg. I lost the kneecap. And I was in danger of losing the leg. And um, the doctor came by. and. I knew the answer, but still I had to ask. I said, doctor, is this going to affect my basketball playing career? He put his arm around me and he said, son, we talked to your coach. You never had a career. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I tell you that story, that little morality play, because it's an apt introduction to the mission that my friend Rhonda Frederick has asked me to perform tonight. It is so because it speaks to the desire of veterans, the men and women who serve this nation, who are damaged in ways that they don't even know, who come home from war desperate to feel normal again. We saw a great tragedy of that desire to play out in an amusement park not far from here with a young man who desperately wanted to feel normal again. And I've had a long-standing and somewhat symbiotic relationship with people and with Rhonda in my professional career. Um, and everyone knows that it would be impossible to say no to Rhonda or to, to people in general. Um, and to Jim Bowles, uh, a wonderful leader in this community who has done so much for disability, dis, disability acceptance and the disabled. But one of the, that's one of the reasons that um, I chose to come here tonight, for the, based on the abiding respect that I have for the personalities and the organization and the way they perform their mission. A mission that involves making special people feel very normal. I watched with admiration as People, Inc. created nurturing, caring environments for a wide range of special people in Western New York. Tonight, though, we deal with an even more special category to me, 
a more special category of our friends and neighbors, our sons and daughters, husbands and wives. Tonight we deal with disability caused by war. It's very fitting that we do so tonight with our hearts heavy with the loss of the 30 Americans who were recently killed in Afghanistan. It's even more fitting that the prospect of many more Western New Yorkers soon to return from war with varying disabilities. In my war, I was among a minority of soldiers who were part of the branch of the Army called the Infantry. The root of the word infantry is, as you might imagine, infant. And it traces its roots back to, through antiquity, to the Roman legions who would take their infant soldiers, their brand new soldiers, and put them in the forward lines of battle. The idea was to weary the enemy as they fought through this first line of infant soldiers, softening them up for the veterans in the rear of the column. And while the methods and means of killing each other have undergone dramatic evolution over the centuries, I've got to tell you that it wasn't a lot more different than it was when I was in the infantry. We were the sharp end of the military spear, the first to fight and the last to rest. And contrary to what many people in this community believe, I was a very reluctant soldier. In my war, we were drafted to fight. And like the Romans, we put the draftees, for the most part, in the infantry. We were young, we were strong, we were eager to prove ourselves. All that I know of war and all that I have heard of peace make it incomprehensible to think that I was ever naive enough to fight in one war and beyond the realm of possibility that I would fight or be part of another. But back then, we were, as they say now, army strong. We thought we were up to any task, and we could defeat any enemy. <coughs> what they forgot to tell us, though, was that there was another side. There was another army. The enemy, we called them. And they felt pretty much the same way we did. So something had to give in the clash between them and us, and clash it did, many times over. More than 58,000 Americans and more than a million Vietnamese were killed in my war. Additionally, there were more than 300,000 GIs, mostly those hapless infantry soldiers I was part of, who were wounded badly enough to be evacuated from the battlefield. One might think that soldiers go off to war imbued with that idea that they might suffer, they might be maimed, and they might die. While that possibility perched on one's shoulder like some deranged parrot pecking everlastingly at one's eye, most soldiers dismiss or deny even the possibility of catastrophe. Otherwise, that overwhelming fear would make it impossible for a soldier to perform in the candid heat of combat. So the great idea of the youngest going into the fight was not exactly the greatest idea when the blood started to flow. And that's what makes disability caused in war different. I would never seek to diminish the challenges that anyone faces struggling with disability. But in war, disability comes at a point in time when we are at our greatest. We are at our peak. When we are strong and confident and brave. 
We are not ready to lose a limb or to lose our sight or to lose our sanity. Those injuries just weren't supposed to happen to us. We believe the propaganda that being the best we can be, and we believed that no matter how surreal, no matter how fantastic, no matter how far from the world that we knew combat took us, that we, we might actually one day be normal again. But in the blink of an eye, or the detonation of a landmine, or in the slight pull of a trigger, life is altered for all time. And the soldier is introduced to a new definition of normal. Instead of teaching a child to throw a curveball, the disabled veteran learns how to use a hook. Instead of using a driver on a golf course, the wounded Marine must master the controls of a vehicle specially adapted to his need. Instead of watching an instructor lecturing in a college classroom, the combat nurse spends her time struggling through post-combat depression. And all the while, these and hundreds of thousands of other wounded souls wonder what happened to me? What happened to the person I used to know? Disability is even more prevalent as a battlefield, as battlefield medicine continues its advance. Injuries that would have surely killed soldiers in my war are now survivable, thanks to the advancements in technique, equipment, and the medical skill of our personnel. Some of those injuries are physical, some are emotional, all are real and all are disabling. In my case, I came home struggling to feel like the same guy who earned that basketball scholarship. When that goal was no longer attainable, I strived instead to see if I could drink more than my buddies. I did that with such success that I was on the verge of losing hope, losing my family, and losing my mind. I was rescued by a caring and compassionate professional at the Buffalo VA named Barbara Wolfram. With her experience, with her expertise, I was put on a course that allowed me, years later, to be there for people and to be there with you this evening. Many years ago, I was introduced what is probably the greatest anti-war song ever written. It's called The Band Played Walsing Matilda. And it is the sad tale of a young Australian sent off to fight in World War I. At a horrific battle on the Crimea, the lad loses both legs to a Turkish artillery shell. It is after that battle that the young man realizes, I never knew there were worse things than dying. The man tells of his homecoming then, and for that, I'll use the exact lyrics from the song. So they collected the cripples, the wounded, the maimed, and they shipped us back home to Australia the legless, the armless, the blind, the insane, those proud, wounded warriors of Suvla. And as our ship pulled into Circular Quay, I looked at the place where my legs used to be, and thank Christ there was no one there waiting for me to grieve, to mourn, or to pity. And while the band played Walsing Matilda, they carried us down the gangway, but nobody cheered. They just stood there and stared, and they turned their faces away. To all of you here at People, Inc., 
to all of you who had anything to do with this wonderful exhibit, to all of you veterans who serve other veterans so proudly, so nobly, you never turned your faces away. You've always turned toward the need. You've always given the hand up. And you've always been in the fore of making sure that people feel and get to act normal in the face of overwhelming odds. Thank you for that understanding. Thank you for that caring. And thank you for being friends to all of our veterans. introduce Guy Marlet, the Amherst W Supervisor, who has a proclamation for us this evening. I just want to first thank, well actually Steve Sanders is from the town board, he's also here today. I thank the judge, here on stage, for just a, an absolute great message. I just want to show you this proclamation, it's really long. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> that should be worth applause. On this. <laughs> what I do want to do is, is I want to be brief, and I want to thank you for, uh, for what you do here. You, know, you, you have taken history, you have kept it as part of our lives to remind us of things that have gone on. You have actually, as far as the town is concerned, we're so grateful that you're here. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm so grateful that you allow us to look at the history and remind us how it's touched our lives in so many different ways. So thank you very much. Thank you again to everyone for being here. Now I invite you to enjoy the exhibit. Um, there are other parts of the exhibit that are in the room down the hall along with some refreshments. So help yourselves and enjoy. Thank you. on maybe how it could uh, benefit the community? Um, well, I think that it'll tr attract an entirely different crowd of people, I think, to the museum and benefit the community by bringing those folks in and helping them to learn about disability and war, but also to learn about all of the other rich history um, of disabled people that the museum has to offer them. Um, so I think in that way it'll benefit the community tremendously. And when it begins to tour around, I think it'll last a very Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to work on the planning of this uh, exhibit. Uh, I'm a historian and some of my writing uh, has been on the history of disabled veterans of World War II and their presence in the movies. And I was very pleased to see one of the panels in the exhibit dedicated to the representation of these veterans in our movies, both more contemporary ones and older ones. Uh, the exhibit is very important because um, it's another way of reminding the community of the presence among us of people who've made sacrifices 
in protecting the liberties of the, uh, of the country and of the population. It's a population that oftentimes in our past people haven't wanted to think about, they need reminding about. When our wars end, most people want to forget that they were fought. So it's very important that we have these prompts that remind people of the importance of the people who fight our wars and the price that they pay. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that is close to me is the Fog of War panel. Um, being a disabled veteran with uh, you know, an unseen uh, disability, is, uh, it, it's nice to have that awareness there because it's not something apparent to everybody every day and uh, to have that put up there and have uh, people be able to uh, appreciate that aspect of it uh, and understand that is, uh, means a lot to me. Okay, and uh, would you think that this is something that maybe other, even current soldiers should come and check out? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's uh, a lot of students uh, that are uh, veterans and a lot of returning veterans, and I think that this uh, kind of bridges the gap uh, between the civilian world and the returning veteran. Uh, for them to be able to share in this together and be able to look at this together and uh, just gaining some understanding of uh, you know each person's side of this. Would you say that's really the key part to take away from this is just understanding? I would have to say, uh, absolutely. That's the best thing that a veteran could ask for is to have somebody understand their uh, you know, needs and uh, their individual situation.